Well, as we have been studying the book of Hosea, we've seen how God pictures himself as a husband. It's a wonderful picture, isn't it? A husband to his people. In fact, this actually separates Hosea from all the other prophets. Yes, Hosea has something very hard to say to the people of Israel and something very hard to say to us today. But it's because the the relationship between God and his people is so precious that these hard things must be said. God has lovingly committed himself to his people, promising that he will be their God, dwelling with them, not not in a way where he... uh, in the, in the same way as he, 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 he is everywhere, uh, but in a special way he would be with his people and they would belong to him. And just as in any marriage, God has made vows to his people and they have made vows to him. He promised to be faithful to them, to provide for them, to protect them from all of their enemies while they lived in the land Uh, that he had given them and in turn they promised to faithfully keep his commandments his statutes his law and to love him above everyone and everything else however as we've been as we've begun the the book of Hosea we've seen that through we've seen through the marriage of Hosea to Gomer that God has been betrayed. He's been betrayed by his covenant people. He's been betrayed, worse still, by his bride. They had committed spiritual adultery against him as they chased after the false gods of the nations instead of seeking him and worshipping him. They have given themselves to others. And now as we come to chapter 4, the Lord begins to lay out the controversy he has with the Israelites. In other words, he is bringing charges against them. He accuses them of failing in their promises to be faithful to him. They have failed to love him. They have failed to know him in increasing measure to walk with him and enjoy fellowship with him. They've gone astray. And they've gone astray by acting wickedly. You can see the the catalogue of offences in verse 2, where there is no, uh, begin with verse 1, there's a lacking of faithfulness, a lacking of love, a lacking of knowledge. And in the place of those things that should have been present, there is instead swearing lying, murdering, stealing, committing adultery. And God says they've broken all bounds. There is no part of the law that this people will not uh, trespass against. They they, They see it as freedom and liberation, breaking off the good commandments that God has given to them. And the result is bloodshed, following bloodshed. And as a result of their increasing corruption and their decreasing spiritual health, the land where they live will come under curse. Verse 3, therefore the land mourns and all who dwell in it languish. And also the beasts of the field and the birds of the heavens and even the fish of the sea are taken away. The land will express, will demonstrate uh, the spiritual condition of the people. It will reflect the spiritual condition of the people as they are barren towards God, as they are like a deserted wilderness, so that the land where they live will become, in the, will become the same. And so God wants his unfaithful bride to listen to him as he tells her where she has gone wrong. 
Now, it's important that he tells them where they've gone wrong. This isn't malicious. You know how when you might have a falling out with someone, you bring out things from the past that, that have hurt you? And why do you do that? Very often you do it in order to put the knife in. You do it in order to hurt. Yes, God is going to hurt his people through his words, through his accusations. But the Lord is doing this more than just to hurt his people. He is a surgeon who cuts in order to heal. Because they need to know where they have gone wrong in order that they might come back to him. And so there are three areas in where, well, there's two particular areas where they have gone wrong. And then there is a caution to be heard. So three things this morning that God has to say to Israel in this chapter. Firstly, we read in verses 4 to 11 about the culpability of the priests. The culpability of the priests. Have you heard the saying, a fish rots from the head down? Well, this is true of the northern kingdom of Israel. The phrase means that when an organisation or a nation, a body of people fails systemically, the leadership, those who are at the head, those who are uh, leading the way, are often the root cause. And this is why God says in verse 4, a a very difficult verse to translate from the uh, Hebrew uh, out of all the verses in in Hosea, uh, let no one contend, let no one accuse. So you see, God has has laid out the the charges, and in verse 4, he he, uh, sees the people like Adam and Eve turning to blame one another. It's their fault, it's his fault, it's her fault. And God says, let no one contend, let no one accuse. Uh, With you is my contention, O priests. his, His contention, first and foremost, his problem, first and foremost, is not with the people, but it is with the spiritual leaders, the priests of Israel. And so in what way are the priests culpable? What, in what way are they deserving of blame above all others for Israel's going astray? Well, they were culpable firstly in their teaching. Verses 5 to 6. You shall stumble by day. The prophet also shall stumble with you by night, and I will destroy your mother. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, because you have rejected knowledge I reject you from being a priest to me. So who were the priests? The priests had been appointed by God in Israel to be the spiritual educators of the people. This meant that they were entrusted with the law of God that had been given at Sinai and with the scriptures given through the prophets uh, that they might know them and teach them to the people. This would mean that the uh, people would, would know what God expected of them. They would understand what he had done for them. And they would walk in his ways. Instead, as the Lord Jesus accused the spiritual leaders of his day, they had become like blind guides. And the blind leading the blind is never a, a good strategy. Because as blind guides, they cause others to stumble. And what made them blind? Well, they had refused, they had rejected the law of God. They didn't guard it as they were meant to. They they threw it away in place for their own traditions and their own laws, their own teachings, and even adopting the teachings of the surrounding nations and religions. So they were culpable in their teaching. They hadn't done as God had appointed them to do. And they were also culpable in the way they led, in their leading. Verses 7 to 10. The more they increased, this is speaking of the priests, the more they sinned against me. I will change their glory into shame. 
They feed on the sin of my people. They are greedy for their iniquity. And it shall be like people, like priest. I will punish them for their ways and repay them for their deeds. They shall eat and not, but not be satisfied. They shall play the whore but not multiply because they have forsaken the law to cherish whoredom, wine and new wine which take away their understanding. So yes, the priests were to be the educators of Israel, verbally teaching what God expected of his nation. But... A teacher must always be setting an example in the lifestyle that they lead. And, and, and the priests were to be examples to others in their own personal daily lives. Like models of this is how you are to live for God. And so the people would not only have a verbal understanding of what God expected, of what the law taught, but they would have a visual picture so that they might know what it looks like to belong to God, what it looks like to be holy. And so you can imagine the priests, uh, because uh, the, the priests were, yes, it was an office but it was, uh, and a role. Uh, it was a designated to a certain group uh, in Israel, uh, and, uh, as they, uh, and you could be born into the priesthood. And so as, as they have children... Because priests in the Old Testament were not like Roman Catholic priests, who were uh, where uh, they're demanded to be to remain uh, celibate. They, uh, they, as they increased in number, what should have happened is righteousness in the land should have increased, shouldn't it? The more priests you have who know the law of God and obey the law of God, the the more models you have, the more righteousness increases. Instead, the opposite was true. The more children they had, the more priests there were, the more sin ran rampant. Not only did, did sin increase in that way, but worse, they, the priests even are accused of profiting from the increase of sin. It benefited them that the people's sins should increase. How? Well, because the priests uh, would eat the sacrifices. So this is what we need to understand in the Old Testament sacrificial system. That it's all food. uh, where, Where harvest is given, first fruits are given, animals are given and sacrificed. It would be the priests who would benefit from that as they would eat from these sacrifices. And the more sacrifices for sin there is, the more they benefit materially. And so we can take verse seven, uh, verse eight, pretty literally. They feed on the sin of my people. It was pleasing to them that the people should sin because they were greedy for their iniquity. The more the people sinned, the more they had. But also perhaps in a spiritual sense as well giving approval to the people living in a sinful way rather than exposing them for their own failures and their own wickedness. They are culpable in their leading, indulging instead in things that take away the knowledge of the Lord and the result of the priest teaching and the result of the priest leading was the people lacked the knowledge of God. Rather than knowing him, rather than enjoying increasing fellowship with him, they had forgotten him. And brothers and sisters, the same is true of God's people today where their leaders fail to teach God's word and to live by it. Teachers in the church are culpable for the people's spiritual condition. And because of this, we find the New Testament making such warnings as this in James chapter 3, verse 1. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. 
Will you pray for your elders? Will you pray for the Sunday school teachers? Will you pray for those who have responsibility to teach God's word? We don't expect our teachers to be perfect. For no, no one is righteous, no, not one, in and of themselves. So we need great amounts of prayer. We will have to give an account for your souls. The culpability of the priests. But secondly, we read about the complicity of the people. The complicity of the people in verses 12 to 14. Because if we think that the priests are being held responsible for Israel's sins, let's the inhabitants of Israel off the hook, we are severely mistaken. They may not be first and foremost culpable for the spiritual state of the northern kingdom, but they are complicit in its spiritual condition. Because they freely and willingly have engaged in pagan idolatry, And here in these three verses, we we see three products of idolatry. Firstly, we see in verse 12 that idolatry produces intellectual depravity. Intellectual depravity, verse 12. My people inquire of a piece of wood, and their walking staff gives them oracles. For a spirit of whoredom has led them astray, and they have left their God to play the whore. So in their committing idolatry, uh, this may be very strange to us, and and, and, uh, particularly in the West, where we are are not familiar with uh, these sorts of superstitions, there was a great amount of superstition that went into idolatry. And they exchanged the truth of God for foolish superstitions. So uh, what were their idols? God says. What were the gods that they they sacrificed to? What were the gods that their hearts were going after? In reality, pieces of wood. It's a piece of wood. It didn't make you. It didn't save you. It didn't provide for you. It is a piece of wood and you treat it like God. And it gets, it gets even, even more bizarre. Because in order to look for guidance from these gods, they would engage in quite bizarre behaviours. So, for example, they would get their staffs. They're, again, another piece of wood. There's no distinguishing from the, the staff that holds them up and the god that they are worshipping. And they would, uh, to find out the will of God, they would throw the staff up in the air and let it land in a particular direction. And based on where it lands is what you would find out the will of that god is for your life. I mean, we would never do anything so stupid, would we? We would never be so superstitious as to look at created things in order to tell us, to to direct us for our lives and to give us guidance. We would never look in a newspaper and find out the position of the stars in the sky and the alignments of the planets to dictate what our future holds or nothing like. I mean, we're far more sophisticated than that, aren't we? Or we would never look for, for signs, that, might, uh, uh, that are outside of the word of God to give us direction. The author and philosopher G.K. Chesterton rightly said this, when men stop believing in God, they don't believe in nothing. They believe in anything. Idolatry darkens the mind, produces intellectual depravity, the lack of knowledge. And idolatry, secondly, produces spiritual infidelity. Verse 13. They sacrifice on the top of the mountains and burn offerings on the hills under oak, poplar and terebinth because their shade is good. So rather than going down to the temple in Jerusalem, 
They exchanged those things for the beauty of hilltop shrines and tree sanctuaries. Because they would rather experience the glory of creation rather than the glory of the true creator. And in, instead of receiving the spiritual blessings that God has promised to all those who would believe in him and follow in his ways, they would rather the immediate blessings of shade. Because shade is tangible. Shade is a, an immediate relief when you're on a hot day. Shade is something that I can feel. The spiritual blessings such as that are listed in Ephesians chapter 1. The spiritual blessing of adoption. The spiritual blessing of redemption. The spiritual blessing of forgiveness. The spiritual blessing of hope. The spiritual blessing of uh, glory to come. All of these are, sometimes they fill us with, with joy, but sometimes we simply believe by faith while we feel, um, well, can I say just normal? I was on a phone call this week with a man who was seeking help, spiritual help. Uh, I don't know his identity, so I couldn't give it if I wanted to. Um, and I offered to simply come and pray with this man but he was looking for a higher experience than talking to the God of heaven and seeking his help. He was looking for a mere man to come and do some ceremonies rather than the truth of God as it is in his word. The ordinary Christian life looks just that, doesn't it? Very ordinary. And so, we, so in, and, and instead of wanting the ordinary, we want the supernatural. We want the high experience. And though there are some uh, spiritual, there is something to be said of spiritual experiences. The ordinary Christian life is simply taking God at his word and following in it. And then thirdly, idolatry produces sexual immorality. Continuing in verse 13 through to 14. Therefore your daughters play the whore and your brides commit adultery. I will not punish your daughters when they play the whore nor your brides when they commit adultery. For the men themselves go aside with prostitutes and sacrifice with cult prostitutes, and a people without understanding shall come to ruin. The spiritual unfaithfulness of the people eventually worked it, its way out in their external behaviour, primarily sexual unfaithfulness to their spouse. And here we find something unusual for the day and culture that Hosea is writing in. And this simply shows us that God deals in truth and not simply in culture. He says, I will not punish your daughters nor your brides. You see, here, here are the women and they, they are engaging in, in promiscuity. promiscuity. Uh, they are engaging in uh, sexual immorality. And in that culture, in that time and in that place, very often the women were dealt with more harshly than a man caught 
in immorality. You remember, for example, when the, uh, the, the religious people caught a woman in the act of adultery and brought her to the Lord Jesus Christ, saying to him, the law tells us to stone her. What, should, what, what do you say? Trying to trip him up. And it's interesting, isn't it, that those religious men found a woman caught in adultery and brought who? The woman and left behind who? The man. So you can see the cultural bias towards laying a guilt of sexual immorality on a woman. I mean, you say again, we, we wouldn't do anything like that in our culture, would we? Where uh, a woman who is sexually immoral gets given all sorts of names and a man who is sexually immoral and promiscuous gets given names like player. No, God says here, counterculturally, I will not punish your daughters when they play the whore, nor your brides when they commit adultery. Why not? For the men themselves go aside with prostitutes and sacrifice with cult prostitutes, and a people without understanding shall come to ruin. You men have led the example in this. You men have been unfaithful when you should have been leading your wives in righteousness. And so here are the idolatrous rituals that, uh, that they participate in. It includes cultic prostitution. And so, yes, the women would most likely have taken on those roles in, in, the, in the ceremonies. But the men were guilty of not only encouraging it, but engaging in it and leading the way in it. Because spiritual unfaithfulness always leads to sexual unfaithfulness. It really does. When our hearts are not right with God, then our hearts also twist our human relationships. The people of Israel, therefore, could not lay any blame, all the blame on the priests. Yes, they had failed to lead them in the truth. And yes, it was true that the priests had led them into this idolatry, but they were willing to follow their lead. And the same is true for us now. That while those who have oversight over our souls as elders in the church will give an account, we are not let off the hook. For we will all stand before the judgment seat of Jesus Christ to give an account of our lives. We are not let off the hook if we simply blindly follow their lead into spiritual adultery or sinful practices. So, the culpability of the priest and the complicity of the people. But thirdly then, we read about the caution of the prophet in verses 15 to 19. Though you play the whore, O Israel, let not Judah become guilty. Enter not into Gilgal, nor go up to Beth Aven, and swear not, as the Lord lives, like a stubborn heifer, Israel is stubborn. Can the Lord now feed them like a lamb in a broad pasture? Ephraim is joined to idols. Ephraim is another name for Israel. Leave him alone. When their drink is gone, they give themselves to whoring their rulers dearly love shame. A wind has wrapped them in its wings and they shall be ashamed because of their sacrifices. Here's Hosea, the prophet to the northern kingdom of Israel. And the Lord now speaks through him to those who are living in the southern kingdom of Judah. And Israel, at this point in time, when Hosea is speaking, is, um, Israel is, is in the grips 
of great sin before the Lord and judgment is coming quickly. Judah, on the other hand, though having its own problems with idolatry and sinfulness, have not yet gone as far as Israel and their judgment will come later. But here is an opportunity for them, a caution given to them, a warning. And what is the, the caution? What is the warning? He cautions them simply, do not imitate the people of Israel. Do not imitate the people of Israel. Do not become guilty of sin like your counterparts in the northern kingdom. Do not go to the places that have become synonymous with your brother's idolatry. Instead, leave him alone. Do not copy him. Do not follow him. Do not join yourself to him. Because to join yourself to him is to join yourself to what they are joined with. And what are they joined with? They are joined with idolatry. They are joined to gods who are not gods. And everything that comes with it. Leave them alone. Be separate from them. And if you do not, you will find that the same judgment promised to Israel will fall upon you. Look what is happening to them, verse 19. A wind has wrapped them in its wings. They shall be ashamed because of their sacrifices. And just as Israel became a caution to the people of Judah, make no mistake, they are also a warning from history for us as well. In Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus, he tells the believers in chapter 5, verse 11, take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness. Remember who you are. You are light in the Lord. You have been saved by a holy God and you are commanded to be holy as he is holy. You remember what it means to be holy? To be separate. To not be like the world in its attitudes and its sinful behaviours. To consider yourself dead to that old way of life and alive to following God and to, and to, to walking in his truth. And, and so, so we are to, yes, we are to, to consider ourselves different from the world around us doesn't mean we try to escape the world around us that would be impossible Paul says but we're not to be like unbelievers who are characterized by uh, by 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 the sins of, of this age we are to be different we're to think differently act differently but not only that it it does mean corporately that we are to be careful not to join uh, with those who uh, profess faith but have wandered from the truth of God in a corporate sense. So we don't, as a church, unite with other so-called churches who have embraced the world's standard of ethics or even church government. who have rejected the gospel as it truly is in the word of God as handed down to us by the prophets and the apostles. We, we could not worship with those who are joined to false gods. We could not work in the gospel with those who say that, uh, that uh, Jesus has died so that everyone may go to heaven and that there is no such thing as hell. Or who would say that there is a work that you must, uh, that though Jesus has died and, uh, for, his, for his people's sins, we must somehow contribute to our salvation through good works and religious practice. 
We deny those things. We say the gospel does not teach those things. The gospel says that it is by the salvation comes by grace alone, uh, through faith alone, in Christ alone, to the glory of God alone. And so, no, we cannot stand on the same platforms as those churches, even in this town, who would deny that gospel. And yes, we might be called strange and we might be looked at as strict. But we say we are simply being faithful to God. It's also why we must be careful about what mission societies we support as the Lord's people. Why we seek to uh, support those missionaries and those missionary bodies who uh, have similar doctrine and practice to ourselves. Because we cannot honour God and partner with those who make a distortion of the gospel in either word or practice. And because by joining with them we would be in danger of becoming like them, wandering away from the truth and inviting God's judgment upon us. Instead we should hear the word of the Lord who says to his people, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, he says to his people, go out from their midst and be separated from them, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing. Then I will welcome you and be a father to you. and You shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. Well, may God himself give us the grace and the boldness to obey him, even if it means being considered badly by others. We do so for the honour and glory of God, who sent his son, the most perfect priest, into the world to lead us into all truth, and to give his life in order that we might be saved from sin and set apart for God. Amen.